Welcome. My name is Petra Harvey, and I'm the health educator at the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Foundation. One of the primary activities of the OI Foundation is to provide timely, accurate, and medically verified information to medical professionals and constituents alike. We will be using this series of podcasts to provide information on a variety of topics related to the diagnosis and treatment of OI. Each monthly podcast will feature an OI medical expert. Today, our podcast features Dr. Laura Tosi, who is an orthopedic surgeon at the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. She is the OI Foundation's representative on the National Bone Health Alliance's Board of Governors and is the principal investigator of the OI Foundation's Adult Natural History Initiative. She is a member of the OIF's Medical Advisory Council and Board of Directors. In addition to Dr. Tosi's professional accomplishments and appointments on behalf of the OIF, she is a dedicated participant and supporter of many OIF events and activities. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Tosi. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Okay, great. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our first question. Uh, Dr. Tess, you've been such a strong advocate for improving the health of adults with OI, and in fact, your study results from the OI Adult Health Study have just been published, which is very exciting. Can you tell us why, as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, you feel so strongly about adult care, and why you push so hard to complete this study? Sure. So, pediatric orthopedics is a really fun profession. We get to help... um, fix a lot of different things, Um, but mostly um, uh, in healthy children. In children born with a uh, birth problem, uh, the, the story doesn't end in a week or a month. It goes on for a very long time. And one of the problems, both in the education of the orthopedic pediatric orthopedic surgeon and even the pediatrician, I think, is that we tend to think that someone's life sort of ends at 18 or 21, 22. And I've been in practice at Children's National Medical Center now for over 30 years. And if I've found nothing else to be true, it's that there really is an ever after. And folks do go marching out into the community. Unfortunately, um, the training of adult physicians, whether it's internists or orthopedic surgeons, um, uh, really doesn't include the care of individuals with um, birth challenges. There's a fair amount of training, I think, on people who have injuries, but not folks, but but not of of to help those physicians take care of uh, folks such as the community who have very specialized needs. And as more and more, more of my patients are technically graduating from my care, the issue of how to help them get the best adult care um, uh, rose to the fore. And as I tried to prepare uh, cheat sheets or information sheets for my patients, I found there was a dearth of information. Uh, and so the primary goal was start to begin to gather data uh, that would help both patients and physicians alike know what to watch out for. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, when we talk about gaps in care for adults with OI, what are we really talking about? Well, I hope my study and other studies will help delineate that. We don't really know. Um, mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, does blood pressure mean the same thing if you have OI or if you don't? Um, uh, how bad is scoliosis? Um, hearing loss, there's... a myriad of challenges that are faced by members of the OI community and the question both in the mind of the patient and the physicians is will standard treatments be helpful here or not 
and and so one of the um uh next steps we we, we gathered a lot of preliminary data but um the critical next step is to try to compare and contrast and learn where are the areas that our community needs to really watch out for and where are the areas where they can accept standard care. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're still learning about these gaps in care. Uh, so speaking to health professionals who may be treating an adult with OI, what type of team would you recommend to provide the best possible care? Well, I I think that probably the most important thing is a pulmonologist, um, a respiratory uh, physician. Uh, As as we become more uh, advanced in our understanding of OI, I think one of the most important things we have come to appreciate is that collagen isn't just in the skin and the bones uh, leading to fragility fractures. It is particularly in lung tissue. And we are becoming more and more concerned that there may be more pulmonary problems that we have, than we have appreciated in the past. And, and so that because there are no standards as to what, pulmonary function should look like in an adult with OI, every patient has to become their own standard uh, and needs to be monitored across time uh, to be sure that their pulmonary functions are not declining. Uh, Because we really think that um, worsening pulmonary functions can put folks at risk for pneumonias or other uh, uh, problems uh, that that would put their general health at risk. So mm-hmm. pulmonary is number one in my head parade, that's for sure. Um, the f- individuals with type 1 OI in particular are prone to hearing loss. And because that is not an issue in children, I didn't really become sensitive to this problem uh, until my patient cohort started to grow older. But in fact, hearing loss, uh, although not a brittle bone issue, is certainly a quality of life issue uh, because so many of our patients start to lose contact uh, with family and friends because they simply can't hear them. Uh, There are some uh, techniques to help ameliorate this situation um, uh, and making sure that patients have access as soon as possible is absolutely essential. As an orthopedic surgeon, uh, I hope that my patients aren't going to break. But the fact of the matter is I'm very worried that they will. And and this is a, a little bit... Um, speaking outside the box, but but I think that um, members of the community really want to study up on the capability of their local emergency rooms. Now, they're never going to find an orthopedic surgeon uh, to care for them when they fracture that has a lot of OI experience, but... Um, there are centers where they really are doing better quality care for individuals with what we call fragility fractures. For the older population that uh, has very poor bone osteoporosis and particularly suffers hip fractures and other uh, disabling injuries. My experience is that the, the orthopedic surgeons that um, specialize in that kind of trauma are the best friend of a person with OI uh, because they're very sensitive to the um, issues of repairing brittle bone and bone that is often small for age, uh, etc. Using creative techniques, what we don't never want to see happen is that a patient gets put at bed rest 
because they have injured. We always say that bed rest makes you age prematurely. It makes your muscles and bones melt. Um, So the other question is, how do we get this patient going as quickly as possible? And again, I think my trauma orthopedics colleagues are particularly sensitive to those issues. So those are the leading three on issues in my hit parade. Um, um, clearly, women will want a uh, sensitive and helpful uh, OBGYN practitioner. Um, uh, that's without a doubt. Mm-hmm. And that, too, may be hard to track down. One of the interesting things that came out of our study uh, was that we asked it, uh, the community to say, well, what's bothering you? What are you worried about right now? And what are you worried about in the future? And one of the um, fascinating responses was that many patients said they had endocrine disorders. And our assumption was, oh, well, this was women worrying about menopause. Well, I go to a lot of different OI meetings, and I asked members of the community how they had responded and why, and I was fascinated that it wasn't osteoporosis that uh, the community was worried about. It was whether the individuals were at risk for diabetes. Now, that's an area we really did not track down in the Ani Natural History Study of OI, uh, and it's clearly going to be an area that we want to look at in, in the future. I am not aware of individuals with um, OI who have diabetes, but we certainly uh, can see risk factors. A uh, number of our older patients don't exercise very much and have troubles uh, with increased fat load, <coughs> which <coughs> may in and of itself put them at higher risk um, uh, for diabetes. So that's an area we're really going to need to look at uh, going forward. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing those results with us. You mentioned earlier that a lot of your patients are graduating into adult care. In your opinion, what are the things a health professional can do for their OI patient who is transitioning into the adult health care system? I think we haven't answered that. Um, um, as, as a, I, I'm hoping that patients will um, find a, a interested um, uh, family practitioner or um, internist uh, who is willing to work with them uh, and, as I say, will help them connect with an audiologist as needed, um, pulmonary, uh, fracture care, and and monitor for diabetes. Uh, but but um, uh, nationally and even internationally, I'm pleased to say that Many health professionals are are seeking answers to that question, but we don't really know the right answer. Um, Some hospitals um, have developed adult, some pediatric hospitals have developed adult care centers um, as part of their pediatric program. So it's uh, generally it's spoken of as. Uh, adults with childhood onset conditions. Some patients are really grateful for that, and other individuals, frankly, want to get up, get out, and be a grown-up. So developing programs that that accommodate everybody's needs is going to be a challenge. The fascinating thing is that we really, I think people with OI have always survived um, uh, into adulthood and, frankly, were just not noticed. And we really saw in our survey um, that we had a lot of respondents, and it wasn't just folks in the 18 to 25-year-old age range, but it was truly across the lifespan. 
I th- think that uh, adults with OI have been out there, they just haven't been recognized. As I started to allude to just a moment ago, um, uh, it's different in a number of other conditions. Um, uh, folks with cerebral palsy really had a much higher mortality rate in the past as did patients with spina bifida, cystic fibrosis, um, uh, congenital heart disease, you name it. And, and so we have a very changing um, adult population and and should is there a role for uh clinics within hospitals that that look at individuals with a congenital disorder of any type um uh to be sure uh that their needs are being met this is just really starting to be discussed energetically at national meetings and at least from a musculoskeletal standpoint, there are only a couple of programs uh, where pediatric orthopedists or pediatric hospitals have stepped up um, uh, and said, we recognize that there is an unmet need. I think it's critical for physicians and patients to um, uh, start writing letters to the CEOs of the hospitals that they go to to be sure that that administrators, folks who control programs, are starting to see this change in the patient demographic uh, so that they get it on their radar and start thinking about how they're going to spend their health care dollars in a way that helps our communities. Thank you. That's great advice. And I agree with what you said about um, the the results from across a lifespan. Um, that's really fascinating that the results came back that way. Um, so we have a couple minutes left. I want to ask you one more question. Uh, what do you see in the future for adults living with OI from a medical perspective? Are there drugs in the pipeline to help or treatment to address different concerns of adults living with OI? Well, I think that frankly, excuse me, <coughs> that the natural history of OI is changing right in front of our eyes. And what I mean by that is that um, most of my patients, and I do sneak adults into my clinic, um, uh, most of my older patients were never treated with bisphosphonate. Um, uh, and all of my severe young patients now are being treated with bisphosphonate. And the uh, difference in the quality of life, uh, the fracture rates, the mobility skills, the independence, I, I can just go on and on and on. It, it's like night and day. And so, ironically, we sort of have the health care needs of the current adults and then we're going to have, I, I think and hope, a very different set of health care needs for the younger patients who are coming along um, because they will be more physically fit, they will be more independent. And in orthopedics, we say movement is life. And so it is my hope and belief that, that uh, the children who were traditionally considered moderately severe and truly severe um, will be very different, that they will not be in wheelchairs all the time, um, uh, that will, they will be out uh, walking to do what they want to do. And, and walking improves bone density, which helps with fracture prevention. So first, you've got to recognize how radically the natural history of osteogenesis imperfecta is changing in front of our eyes. For the adults that are out there, unfortunately, giving bisphosphonates uh, in adulthood does not have nearly the same positive impact on bone quality or fracture risk. So that's disappointing. On the other hand, there are 
um, a couple of different medications that use a whole different philosophy, um, take advantage of very different science than bisosinates do, that are just at the very beginning of uh, being examined. Uh, but the the uh, uh, scientific basis of why these drugs work makes great sense, um, and and the early data from animal models is very positive. Um, so it is my dream and belief that preferably in five, but more realistically, probably closer to ten, that years we will have um, drugs that will help folks across the lifespan. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective on GAPS and OI adult care. And uh, we so appreciate passionate and talented physicians like yourself. So for more information on anything that Dr. Tosi talked about today, you can visit the OI Foundation's website at www.oif.org or email bonelink at oif.org. So thanks again for joining us today, Dr. Tosi. We will be back for another podcast next month.